Part 1. You will hear a woman phoning about an event at a botanic garden. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning. You're through to the treehouse at the Botanic Garden. How can I help? Oh, hello. I'd like to book a place on the, um, Japanese floral art workshop. Ah, yes. Do you mean our workshop on the 16th? No, it's on the 6th. Saturday the 6th. Ah, yes. Got it up here on screen now. Japanese Floral Art Workshop. That's great. You're just in time. We're nearly full. Twelve people have already booked a place, and this workshop is limited to 15 participants. It's one of our most popular workshops. In fact, it's the fifth one we've run. And this is the last one this term. There won't be another workshop until next year now. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. And can I just check the start time? It says on the leaflet I've got here that it begins at 12.30. That's right. It finishes at 1.30. Most of our other workshops are only half an hour long, but this one is longer. In fact, we're thinking of running some longer ones in the future. Oh, I see. Well, I'm really glad it lasts for a full hour. I don't think I would be able to come up with any kind of floral arrangement in less time than that. And certainly not in 30 minutes. <laughs> Me neither. Now, one more thing. The workshop itself is free, but we're asking participants to pay £5 each just to cover the cost of the floral supplies. That's fine. Now, before I book you a place, I'll just give you some information about what will happen on the day. Now you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 5 to 10. Basically, it's a real hands-on workshop, so you'll be making your own floral arrangement that you can take home afterwards. That's great. I'm really looking forward to that. Now, a couple of important things. Please remember to bring scissors or cutters to the workshop. Unfortunately, we only have a limited number of pairs to lend people who forget them on the day. Last year, some participants ended up using pen knives, which are not at all suitable for floral arranging. Right. I'll make a note of that. And you'll also need to bring your own container. Do you mean a bag, that sort of thing? No, you need a shallow container. Basically, it has to be shallow with a wide base, so that you can use it to work on your arrangement. It can be pottery, wood, plastic, whatever you like. Oh, of course. I see. I'm sure I can find something suitable. And when you arrive for the workshop, ask for Elizabeth Macmillan. She's leading the event. She's a really experienced workshop leader. She's been running the event for us for many years, so you'll certainly be in good hands. That's good to know. Now, I'll just take your details for the booking form. Can I have your first name? Yes, it's Lubna. Lubna. Can you spell that for me? L-U-B-N-A And your surname? Awan. Is that A-W-A-M? No, it's an N at the end. Thank you. And a contact number, just in case we need to get in touch with you before the workshop. Yes, it's 0759 830 5321. 
Thanks. That's all the information we need. So that's you booked in. Oh, actually, just one more thing. Would you like to be on our mailing list? This means that we can send you information about future events and workshops. All we need is your email address. Yes, that's great. My email address is lawan25 at yahoo.com. OK, I'll just read that back. L A W A N 25 at yahoo.com. Yes, that's correct. OK, I'll pop all your details on the system and we'll see you at the workshop next weekend. Thanks a lot for your help. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a woman talking about health and safety when using a computer. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello everyone and welcome to the second session on health and safety. And today we're focusing on health and safety when using a computer. Now, can you all gather round this workstation here? That's great, thanks. OK now. Let's look at some equipment that is specifically designed for safe computer use. Firstly, take a look at this item here. Yes, the sloped slab in front of the keyboard. Does anyone know what it is? That's right, it's a wrist rest. And it does a lot more than take up room on your desk, I can tell you. <laughs> well... What does it do exactly? In actual fact, it's specifically designed to support your wrist when you're typing or when you're using a computer mouse. Now, the one I'm holding in my hand is made of foam rubber. Come on now, have a feel. You know you want to. Now, it's very flexible, isn't it? The padding is firm but it also gives way when you press it, just like this. Here's another type, by the way. This one is filled with gel. Now, like the foam rubber type, it's got a firm surface, but when you press it like this, it gives way with a little spring. However, not all wrist rests are flexible like that. Some are made from hard plastic. That doesn't sound like a comfortable support for your wrist, does it? So, not to be recommended. OK, so we know what kind of material we're looking for in a wrist rest. But what else do we have to think about before we choose one? Now, look again at the foam rubber wrist rest here. You can see that the slope of the wrist rest and the height and the width too match the front edge of the keyboard here. And there are no sharp edges. Look, it's really nice and smooth. Now, we know it's a busy time for you all at the moment. You're busy with assignments in between the hours you're spending browsing the net and going on social networking sites. <laughs> well, just think about how hard your wrist has to work. 
So, using a wrist rest like this one can really help in a number of ways. First of all, it helps you keep your wrist straight when you're using your computer. I'm demonstrating this now. As you can see, my wrist is neutral and straight rather than bent up and down. See what I mean? Now, it can also provide padding for your hands. It works in much the same way as a cushion, so it makes your desk much more comfortable. Now, please note, I did say cushion rather than pillow. We don't want you students to be too comfortable. Another advantage of a wrist rest is that it stops your hands from dropping off the edge of the keyboard. A wrist rest can also relieve tension and soreness in your neck and shoulders. And how does it do that exactly? Well, it removes the weight of your arm from your shoulders and neck altogether. So there are a lot of benefits, aren't there? However, most people never learn how to use a wrist rest correctly. In fact, leaning your wrists on a wrist rest for long periods can put a lot of pressure on the undersides of your wrists, just here. Now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 18 to 20. So, to make the most of your wrist rest, it's really important to follow a few basic tips. First of all, make sure you place your wrist rest approximately one and a half inches away from your keyboard like this. And never ever place your wrists directly on your wrist rest. Instead, place the palm or ball of your hand on the rest. And another thing, don't use the wrist rest all the time, particularly when you're typing. Instead, your hands should be on the wrist rests during break periods, so between your typing sessions. This will avoid you putting strain on your wrists and fingers. Now, does anyone have any questions before we move on to computer glasses? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about waste between a tutor and a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 23. Well, we've been looking at the issue of waste this term, and as you know, it's a huge area to research. Now, Hannah, just to recap on our last session, 
We identified a range of sources of waste. Can we just run through these very briefly before we make a start? Yes, I've got a note of them here. We've got waste from industry, commerce, quarrying, and construction. And then, of course, there's household bins and litter. Great. Now you were going to focus on industrial waste, weren't you? How's the research going? Well, actually, I decided to go with household waste in the end and focus on food. I've been looking at exactly what we throw out and how much. Now, maybe this won't come as much of a surprise to you, but I was really amazed at just how much food we throw away in the UK. We throw away over seven million tons of food every single year, seven point two million to be exact. That's quite right. In the latest survey, it's been estimated that we're wasting one third of the fo food we buy. Exactly. That's like one in every three bags of food shopping going straight into the bin. I think the worst thing about it is that more than half of this. Is food we could actually have eaten. So to give you some examples, things like unopened pots of yogurt, whole chickens. Yes, people actually throw out whole chickens. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-four to thirty. Now, have you got any figures to support this? It's important to include these in your final assignment. Yes, I've got a note of them somewhere. Yes, here they are. Let's start with yogurts. Now, one point three million of them go straight in the bin. And five and a half thousand whole chickens. Oh, and I've got another example: bread. An amazing seven million slices of bread are completely wasted too. Okay, you've got some solid figures there. And don't forget to explore the reasons why we throw out food we haven't even opened. One interesting point worth making here is that. Basically, we often completely forget about what we've bought, so we stick the box of eggs in the fridge and our packets of biscuits at the back of the cupboard, and they just lie there, completely unused. And on the subject of eggs, you might be shocked to learn that we throw away 0.7 million of them every single day, and the same amount of packets of biscuits. I think that people need to think more about how they are storing and using the food they buy. That's a good point. What do you think is the problem there? Do we all need to change our attitude to food? Definitely. Part of the problem is that we've come to expect our food to look uniform and, well, perfect. So we want our apples to be green all over and to be a certain shape and size. This means the farmers, and then we as consumers, end up throwing away perfectly good food just because it has a blemish or a mark. What's wrong with a green apple that has some red colour on it too? What's wrong with a tomato that has a slightly strange shape? But that kind of attitude may explain why there is so much waste. In fact, these are exactly the foods we waste most of. We throw out far more of those than we do bakery items like cakes and biscuits, and just to give you some idea of quantities, we're throwing out 5.1 million whole potatoes, 4.4 million whole apples, and 2.8 million whole tomatoes on a daily basis. And then there are the sell-by and use-by dates. They encourage us to throw away food long before it goes off. Thanks, Hannah. You've highlighted an interesting point: that waste is very much a social issue. Okay, okay. Let's leave it there. 
We can look at the issue of initiatives to reduce waste next. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a talk about motivation. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully to the talk, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Okay, everyone. Let's make a start with the second module of our business management course, and we're thinking about motivation. Yes, motivation—the drive to achieve and to get things done. Now, what motivates you to get up in the morning? A strong desire to get that assignment finished. Or maybe you want to get more training in before the week's inter-university football match. Let's focus on motivation in the workplace. Why is it so important for workers to be motivated? Think about it. If you feel motivated, you're far more likely to feel loyal to your employer, and take a real pride in getting the job done. So, how can a company motivate its workers to work well? Well, let's have a look at this. It's called the motivational pyramid, and it was developed by a man called Abraham Maslow. He called it the hierarchy of needs. He argued that people are motivated by five essential needs, and he formed this pyramid here to illustrate each of them. And you can see the five tiers or levels on the pyramid. Maslow said that workers are motivated at these five levels of need. So let's look at each of them in turn. Okay, now, so let's start at the bottom of the pyramid, just here. Now these are the basic physical needs. These are the needs that motivate us to survive and have food and shelter. So we're motivated to work in return for money, so that we can actually eat. And keep warm, but even at this basic level, we're not just motivated by money alone. We're also motivated to work if we've got good facilities in the workplace. What kind of facilities are we talking? Well, these facilities could be a staff restaurant to have our lunch in, or a locker to put our personal belongings in. Now, after we've got these things. We are then motivated to move up to the second level of need on the pyramid, and here, on the second tier, we can see security needs. We're motivated to work hard when we feel safe and secure. Well, we're much more likely to work well if we've got a formal job contract. It makes us feel safe, doesn't it? And what about a pension when we're old and no longer able to work? And we're also much more likely to feel safe and secure if we know there is a sick pay scheme we can fall back on if we're ill and have to take time away from work. Okay, so here we are at the third tier. Yes, just here. Social needs. Now, social needs refer to the need people have to belong or to be part of a group. Teamwork's a very important motivator. What does this mean in practice? Well, it might mean encouraging workers to get together to discuss various issues within the organisation. For example, pay increases. Now you have some time to look at questions.
Then we move on to the next tier, the fourth one here, self-esteem. This means the kind of motivation that encourages us to experience a real sense of achievement. So, how can a company make this happen? Well, they can use a system of rewards, giving rewards to individual workers as a way of saying thank you and celebrating their achievements. What kind of rewards are we talking about? Well, examples of these include free gym membership, or gifts such as contract-free phones. This kind of recognition can make us feel valued, and as a result, we feel more motivated to move up to the final level of the pyramid. On the final tier, we've got self-fulfillment. Now, this is the motivation that inspires us to be creative. And feel challenged in the workplace. So, what does this mean in practice? Well, it means making sure that workers have the opportunity to do the training they need, and at the same time provide them with a personal development plan to help them reach their true potential. Personal development plans can help workers make progress and achieve higher goals. So, there we have it. The hierarchy of needs, achieving each of these tiers one level at a time, and moving up the pyramid, motivates us to achieve the next. Now, does anyone have any questions before we move on? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.